I will show some concepts, but uh, my experiments, I mean, my presentation will stress some practical aspects that we are going to follow afterwards in the time that we, when we do the, the practical session corresponding to these, to, to, to these topics, to these uh, issues. Well, my, my laboratory is interested in mechanisms of human diseases using drosophila, basically the basis of this course. And before getting into the, the topics directly, I wanted just briefly to show the ICGB. This ICGB, the organization, is made out of three components. And what those ones that you see in green are the member countries that belong to this, this organization. And here in Trieste, we are 16 research groups that we do different many topics, and we have some capacity of experimentation here. Just very brief. The issue that I'm interested in, um, getting into the topic, the specific topic, is the neurodegeneration, the case dementia, no? the big topics of the dementia that occur because of the neurodegeneration. This is a very a huge uh, health problem, and with the aging of the population, this uh, gets more frequent. No? And the most common causes of, of, of dementia are these diseases. That uh, are very known, are very frequent, and then they are characterized basically. I mean, they have what they have in common. They are different, but what they have in common is a common aspect of these diseases is the formation of extracellular or intracellular protein aggregates. Is what they have in common, no? And the main question of the field is to know how these deposits form, how do they form these deposits, and once they form, how do they kill neurons? And these are the issues more relevant uh, for, for, for the question, no? Getting back into this is another important question in the field is when these de this de this deposits start forming? This is very interesting because if they start forming, I mean, the disease appears in the adult age, but they could start forming during development in the very early ages of the, of the new information, and they could change completely the, the vision or the view of the, of the disease. The, um, the other thing that we want to know is a uh, mechanism by, why, by which these um, aggregations kill the neurons. And the other things that we want to know is if the neurons can recover, if they have some plasticity that we could recover if we somehow stop the problem. To answer this question, as you know, uh, we get into, into drosophila because of the well-known system, the system that is very well-known. It was used in laboratories for more than 100 years. They, this allowed to develop a lot of genetic tools into these flies because of the time that they were in the labs. The genome of these uh, insects are a lot less redundant, almost a gene, uh, a gene for a function, a function for a gene. And the, the things that got me to work with Rosophila for neurodegenerative disease is the high homology that they present with the human genes. An example of this is this cartoon here that you can say that from 700 human disease genes caused by single mutation, 78, almost 80 percent of these are perfectly conserved in drosophila. Now this is a huge conversation, conservation. Then the questions: there are two ways. How do we use drosophila for answer human neurodegenerative disease or neurodegenerative disease in general? There is two main ways that we can do this. One is to express in drosophila human genes related with the disease that may produce a dominant phenotype, like in this case. In this case, we generate transgenic flies expressing a variant of the human tau gene that presents a long exon inside. It's a very long form of the, of the tau that is only present in Alzheimer's patients. It's not present in normal patients. And to check what this the expression of this gene does in the fly. And we look it at the eyes of the flies because it's a strong concentration of neurons. In this structure, that has drosophila size, you have more than 10,000 neurons at once that you can look at. And then this is what happened when we express the human tau involved in the disease, and we see that produce this degeneration of this structure. Basically, the question that we want to know is what has happened here between these two scenarios. No? This is one way, expressing drosophila, human proteins mutated in the disease and produce dominant phenotypes. Another way is to analyze 
In Drosophila, the function of conserved genes that they are associated with the diseases. And this is the case of TDP43. This TDP43 was identified in human patients in this aggregate. They isolated aggregates from human patients suffering from ELS, and then they found that conspicuous protein present in these aggregates was TDP43. This TDP43 present here I mean, indicates many things because the patients are very heterogeneous population. And once you find something that gets aggregated, present in aggregates, you don't know if the protein was really related to the disease process, no? Either the protein produced the disease, was there, is a consequence of something else. What is the relationship, basically? The question is, what is the relationship between a protein inside the aggregates in human brains and the disease? This is not known directly from this experiment. It could be suspected, but it's not a proof. In this case, TDP43, for instance, appear here, we found that this is the human protein. The human protein presents two RNA binding domain, nuclear localization signal. It's an RNA binding protein. And cytoplasmic tail, uh, N terminal, uh, C terminal tail. And the drosophila is bigger. It's a, it's a longer protein. It's bigger. It has more, much more amino acids. Instead of 43, it has kilodalton. It's, it's, it's heavier, 53. It's longer. But if we take, and the conservation general, the identity is 46% overall. But if we concentrate in this part that is related with the RNA binding, the functional part, we see that the homology is 75%. And this is almost identical. And the most variable part is this C-terminal one. So it's very strong homology. Then what is the function of this protein? This is an RNA, as I anticipated, this is an RNA binding protein related with many aspects of the RNA biology. This is quite complex thing. This is many things. There could be splicing, could be translation, transcription, many others. But the, the point is that this protein makes this, and this was identified, uh, is that they produce this function by binding to the RNA, and they know that this, this binding takes place in this region, and it depends on the presence or not of this lysis or feminine. If you mutate these guys here, this protein doesn't bind to the RNA anymore. Okay? It was identified, and it also was identified that it can recognize GUE, GU rich sequences in the messengers. These are the two things that they were known. And the other were what was found in patients, not that the protein normally in the nucleus. In patients appear cytoplasmic, aggregated, phosphorylated, many modifications in the cytoplasm, but depleted from the nucleus. Then the basic questions to know here at this point when we start with this project that was immediately after this was identified in the plasma because this is one of the approaches that we have. I mean, proteins that appear in human samples are a good starting point if you want to know the, the role of these genes in the regenerative process. Is to know what is the function of this, of this protein and whether or not it's involved in the degenerative protein process, not that it appears. And of course, by which mechanism. To get inside into that, what we did is basically we got flies and we generated mutations, genomic mutations inside the locus of this gene. That was concerned. This is the drosophila gene, it's called TBTH. We generate antibodies, we generate this deletion that we map, map it by PCRs, and then made an antibodies, and we saw that in these two different mutants allele, the protein is gone, indicating that these are genetic nulls. The phenotypes that these flies got, you can see here, it's very difficult to know which one is the wild type and which one is the mutant. And one is the mutant, but the other not. Okay? Externally, it doesn't, they look identical. But if we do some behavioral assays that we will check together, if we do some behavioral assays, um, we, can, we can see the wild type slides work like these ones. But instead, the mutant flies present these locomotive behaviors, as you can see here. They have a strong coordination problem and strength of the muscles and coordination. They are difficult to die. But look at this. This other one is a, it's a rescue fly. It's a mutant fly rescue with a human gene, the human gene in motoneurons. You can see that the expression of the human gene in motoneurons is able to recover the phenotypes that you saw in the fly before. These phenotypes were quantified here. These are the wild type. These are the mutant. You see, in walking assays that we will see during this course, 
uh, they are not able to perform. And these are the rescue ones. And when you rescue either with the wild type protein, the endogenous protein, or the human protein in different cell populations, you see that they can recover the walking activities as well as the climbing activities. They cannot climb, they even cannot move. This is just to, to see that the genetics is okay. And also the lifespan. I mean, mutants have very short lifespan. Meanwhile, the, mute, the rescue ones, the, the lifespan get strongly extended. And these are the way that we describe the phenotype. This protein appeared in patients with DLS, and we saw that these flies quite tightly reproduce the phenotype that the patient could have, you know? like this muscle weakness, twitching, impairment use of arms and legs, short and breath difficult, and reduction of the, la of the lifespan. Then, with this experiment that we did, analyzing the role of the endogenous gene in relation to, to the function, we could say that this gene, TDP43, could replace the endogenous protein in Drosophila to reactivate locomotive, no? And then we can extrapolate that it, maybe this is the role that this, or most probably this is the role that this gene is having in human patients. Okay. The main phenotype that we saw was locomotive problems. Then, this is the way that we started analyzing these mutants, no? Start with the locomotive problem. What could be the origin of this locomotive problem? So you that this protein is very pleiotrophic in their functions. And when we went to look, the neuromuscular junctions. Neuromuscular junctions are the synapses that motor neurons forms in muscles, in the larvae and the other flies. And for this, what you see here is labeled with a, a GFP are the motor neuron nerves that form this terminal. These are the terminal of the neuromuscular junction and the synapses that the motor neurons form in the nerves, in the, in the muscles of this life. And they look like that. What we found basically was that this is the wild type neuromuscular junction, this is the distribution, the area of the synapses in the muscles. We saw that the mutants, TBPH mutants, present a reducing pattern of synapses. This you see is less innervated, is less branched, it has less uh, synaptic potents. And when we rescue with the human protein, we saw that we can recover the innervation of the muscle, indicating that these phenotypes are quite specific. Are quite specific of the innervation because when we look at the number of motor neurons that are present in the brains, we saw that they are conserved. There is no the same motor neurons loss in these brains. No? This is a GFP with a motor neuron specific driver, and then we saw that these motor neurons in mutants or in wild type brains are conserved. Indicating that it's not a general problem of neurodegeneration, but this is some more specific thing of the innervation. We see also that the muscle looks okay in terms of acting cytoskeleton or microtubule, but we are revising the thing, but at this time, look it, at this resolution, look it, it looks okay. But when we go to the synapses, these are the synapses buttons, these are exactly the terminal, this is where the uh, neurotransmission takes place, the synaptic buttons are the neuromuscular junction, they look like that, very, very perfectly round, but we see that in the mutants, there are this kind of problem. These structures are right, innervate the muscle, but they cannot form proper synaptic buttons. You see, they look very misshaped. And when we rescue with endogenous protein, we could recover the, 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 the shape, the normal shape. These experiments are important, the rescue experiment, because they indicate that what you are seeing is specific of the loss of function of this gene. This was interesting because these round structures are due to the presence of this protein. It is called Fuchin drosophila, but in human it's concerned, it's called MAP1B. It's a microtubule binding protein that associates to microtubule and produce these very particular structures. You see, MAP1B make these worms of the microtubules that you can see here. I mean, you see this, okay, these worms here, and these are at the base of this round shape. This was described by different people. And then what we found is that the, we confirmed the, the histochemical data by Western blood. We saw with an antibody against MAP1B, we saw that this is effectively reducing our mutants and can be rescued these levels again. All our experiments show two mutants allele plus the rescue allele. And then we see that this effectively the protein is downregulated. Then what do this protein does? Uh, what does the protein do is basically stabilize microtubule. And the stabilization of microtubule is a major problem in the, problem in the neurodegenerative disease, especially in DLS. Microtubule somehow get unstable and then cannot keep the structure. Now, and this is what happened here because we 
we use uh, acetylated tubulin, it's a specific antibody. Acetylated tubulin is a modification of stabilized microtubules. Then stable microtubules will look with acetylated, and then we see that in the, in the, in the acetylated microtubules at the end of the synaptic buttons are not present and not so conserved, and they can be rescued, and this was quantified there. Then we saw problems in MAP1B, problems in the stabilization of the microtubules. Then we did some other genetic tru tricks to confirm that this was effectively the role of this protein in, in, this, in these events. No? Is this MAP1B food involved in this phenotype? Because it's missing, but if it's, the protein is missing, you still don't know if this is the cause of the, of, of the phenotype. And then we, we did something like this. This is how the mutants, heterozygous mutant of MAP1B looks like. And this is how the mutants of TBPH looks like. And this is what's happened when we rescue these phenotypes, putting the protein, endogenous protein back, you see that you rescue this. But if you try to do these rescues in this background, what you find is that this cannot rescue anymore, or not so efficiently. Indicating that you need the full dose of this protein to get this, the rescue, like in wild type background. Okay? These are heterozygous background. Indicating they have a role in the in, the, in, in these, uh, in these uh, neuromuscular junction formations. And another experiment that we need to confirm the role of this is this protein, what it has is to perhaps stabilize in microtubules. And then we wonder whether stabilizing microtubules alone was enough to restore the structures in these flies. And for that, we use tau, that is protein that stabilizes microtubules, one of the functions of tau to stabilize microtubules. And stabilizing microtubules with the different microtubule associated protein, like that, we found that we managed to re innervate these muscles and to restore the synaptic button shell. Okay? Confirming that it was. Moreover, we found that also the expression of tau, stabilizing microtubule, also recovers. I oh know this is an experiment before. We found that the stabilization of microtubules is important for restoring this phenotype. This is basically the heterozygous of MAP1B, the heterozygous of the, the loss of function of the mutant, rescue of the mutant with the endogenous protein. And here, try to rescue the protein, the mutant with the endogenous protein in the presence of the heterozygous of this guy. It's not terrible. Expressing with tau alone, the mutant's phenotype with tau, the ones that stabilize microtubules, is enough to stabilize the tubulin and restore the shape. Okay? These phenotypes were quantified here, from quantified also here, and basically what we found is that the loss of TBPH reduced MAP1B protein levels, and this is what affects the formation of synaptic mo molecules. But then the question is how a protein which is in the nucleus regulates a protein that has a role in the synaptic buttons, no? This was also. What is the relationship between these guys? But to answer this question, we make a round long. We need a, a good control to see whether or not this protein is related. No? And for this, what we did is a TBPH protein that is not able to bind to the RNA. This, this protein is identical to this guy, but it's not able to bind to the RNA with two point mutations in only one RNA binding domain. The other is completely wild type. We found that this allele that cannot bind to the RNA localized like the wild type. There is no problem in the localization of this protein. And what we did, this was important, what we did was pull down experiments using this protein and the ones that cannot bind the RNA as a control, have a perfect control, one that binds, that is that binds. We did pull down experiments and went to look at whether or not this could be able of this protein to interact with the messenger of MAP1B. We we guess this experiment because we saw that this gene, MAP1B messenger, has a lot of UG repeats that could be the putative sites that could be bind and recognized by TBPH. No? This put we saw by PCRs that in the IP with the TBPH1 that cannot bind to RNA, we don't get uh, the, the um, we don't get the binding to the messenger of MAP1. Okay. Indicating that this is specific. This was quantified in this assays. And this was specific. And the other thing that we demonstrated here 
is that the ones that cannot bind to the uh, RNA is not able to rest. And you can that RNA binding protein, the bind, RNA binding protein function, is essential for the activity of this protein. It depends on the RNA binding, basically. This was quantified here. I show you how we rescue the innervation. And also demonstrated that the ones that cannot bind RNA cannot recover also the food level. Cannot bind, binds directly, if it's not there, cannot bind, cannot recover, indicating that the <coughs> levels are regulated directly by the RNA binding activity of TBPH. Okay? And then is also the immunocytochemistry was quantified at the Western blood level. Good. These were the conclusions. TBPH regulates synaptic growth and synaptic shape through the direct interaction with the MAP1B RNA uh, messenger. This was the initial step to indicate what was the role of this protein in the process of neurodegenerative process. Indicating that this was the starting point of this project, but now the questions get more complicated. We wanted to know what was the temporal requirement of these things, because the patients appear, the patients carry mutations in each gene from all the, all the life, no? From the, because, and these mutations were characterized that they were impairing the function of the protein, no? indicated that maybe this protein has a role during development and may not have a role in the other case. I mean, basically, the question is, in the moment that they appear in the aggregate, is having a phenotype, or the phenotype was produced before? has a phenotype during development, has a phenotype only in, in differentiated neurons, or both? This is the question that we try to, to solve here. Another question that we wanted to, to know, something that we wanted to know, is whether or not the motor neurons that were affected because of these defects were able to regenerate or not. This is something very, we very much wanted to, to, to address. No? To answer this question, we generated this system that is a conditional system of expression. We use a special guard force that can be activated with the drug in this case. There are many ways to activate guard force, but the ones that we use in this situation is this GS activator uh, promoter, that when you put this drug, GS, this drug, it activates the promoter and then drives expression. Only with this. And then we show that when we don't activate the promoter, there is not protein expression, and when we activate the promoter with different RU, different levels of RU, we get protein expression, and what we wanted to get here is to get expression of the protein at the same levels than the wild type. And this was very important, because if we express a lot of protein, this protein could be toxic. In fact, it is toxic if you express too much. If you express too less, then you have phenotype because of the lack of function of the protein. Then, it was very important to quite some time to generate this, this, this situation where we can express two more or less wild type layer. And then what we found is basically, basically is that, um, that what we found here with this experiment is that expressing this protein with this system at wild type levels, we got rescue of the TBPH minus phenotypes, you can see here. And it's very uh, illustrate, illustrative because we say, with different drug concentration, we get better, better, better rescue, but if we increase the expression, we start to get deleterious effect again. You know? This is very important to get into this point where you express the protein in a proper concentration. And this was the concentration that we got the best rescue. Okay, that was, I think was, one of these one, 0 0.05. We saw that this gets rescue of the motility defect. These are climbing uh, larval movements that we are going to go through in the practical. We saw that this recovers these this motility problems and also recovers the innervation of the neuromuscular junction. This is when the promoter is not activated. When you activate the promoter at the concentration that I showed you before, you get the rescue of this phenotype. And this is what happens when we express the, the isoform of the protein that cannot bind to the RNA that we use it as a control. Now, what we wanted to ask was what was the, the, the half-life of this problem? What happened when this problem is not expressed or what happened when we block the, the, the expression of this problem? And then we set this way to express the problem at different time points. For instance, we express 24 hours, 72 hours, 96 hours, and we stopped the expression and went to make the assays at the end. 
to see what happens. The prophet, if the prophet uh, uh, gives phenotype, means that it's permanently required. The protein, if you express for 24 hours and then you get rescue, indicates the protein has a role that already he has a role here or here, no? And this is how it looks like. And then what we found, we checked the expression, we checked the, the, the larval movements, and then what we found is that this 24, 20, 48 or 24 hours uh, release, there is no rescue. Okay, only with very short release, 12 hours of permanently required, indicating that you need the expression of the problem of the protein permanently in motor neurons to not have motility defect. Okay? Also, you need the expression of the protein permanently to not have innervation problem. Not only control the function of this neuron, but also the innervation, no? If you release for 12 hours, it's okay, it's like if you don't release it at all. But if you release the expression for 24, 48 hours, then you see that the innervation gets... If you don't express the protein at all, this is how it looks. You see there is some degree of innervation, but not like this other one. Okay? Then the protein is permanently required to avoid the motility problems and to avoid innervation defects. What happens if we silence the protein in adult flies? at any time point. And this is what we did, and then to silence the protein here, we use the, sim the, the, the same system, and we use the same system, Julia, right? GSM. Yeah. And the thermosensitive one, this is Galeti. Yeah. Okay, we dis use different system here, I didn't remember. We use a different system here. We use a GAL4 that is temperature sensitive. When you increase the temperature, then the GAL4 doesn't work anymore. Okay, we stop the, 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 or gets, um, no, gets activated. The repression, it gets the repress and it gets activated. It's a repressor that gets, uh, it's a repressor that gets uh, deactivated with temperature. Okay, it has the GAL4, a repressor of the GAL4 that is thermosensitive. When you increase the temperature, this guy doesn't work, and then the, the, um, the reporter gets expressed. We did these combinations, and then what we did, we grow other flies, the flies were perfectly okay, and then we changed the temperature, and then we found that the protein got reduced, strongly reduced, because we express an RNA against TBPH that reduced the protein at this temperature, and then we found the reduction of the protein acutely <coughs> at this stage, for, I don't remember, it's like 24 hours or maybe less, it got immediately produced locomotive problems in these adult flies, indicating that it's permanently required in development, but if you block it any time in the other life, you start having neurological defects. Um, we did the opposite uh, experiment. We did the opposite. We wanted to know whether mutant flies could restore, regenerate the function, expressing this protein very late in the adult life. We use the same system that we use to repress the protein to express the protein now in mutant flies. These mutant flies, they cannot move, they move like you, you saw already. And we induce the expression of the, of the protein uh, 60 hours from the adult life, it's like, like a four days, three, four days, three days, three days, and these, these, these flies were mutant during the complete development, the mutant all the time. And then we activate only a 60 hour of the other life. You can see here. These are the control heat. The non-activated one don't express protein at all. And what we found is that they work like that, but when we start activating the protein, they can recover the locomotive function. Okay? But not also recover the locomotive function. What we do, we do we did the same experiment in the in the mature larvae that were mutant during development, but at the very late stages of the, of the larval life, we activated again the expression of the protein, and then we found you have to compare these ones with this one, that we got the recovery of the, the path from this to this. This is the stage not activated, and then they get activated, and they recover not only the motility, but also recover the innervation of the muscles. Okay? This is the one that uh, is active, active to, to, 
uh, all the time, in part from here to the here, the one that doesn't rescue and the one that rescues. Okay? The late expression of the protein also activates the innervation or promotes the innervation, the recovery of this, of the innervation of the muscle, basically, and the locomotive in adult flight. This is described here. The protein is permanently required. The acute expression induced locomotive protein, that could be the problem of the sporadic ELS, because in the ELS, uh, the things that is found may, in the majority, the great majority of the cases, is problems in TDP43. And then we will say, if you have problems, and they are sporadic form, these, these persons doesn't have mutation in the protein. The protein is mislocalized, let's say, but not with mutation that could predict this. Then, in the sporadic case, we could say that if you have problems with the levels of the protein, of the function of the, function of the protein, you could have this, this, this disease. And also, the last, we saw that they, at least there is some plasticity in the mutant neurons that could recover the innervation and could recover the motility. Now the question is how? I mean, we found that the, how TDP recovers or regulates these things. And then we, we did some genome-wide analysis. We got a lot of candidates, but there were too many that then we say, well, let's try genetically to set the paradigm to see what's going on, and then try to fill it with information that we got genomic-wide. No? Then what we did is we took this larvae and silence acutely at the end, within 24 hours, at the end, this is the, this, the, the initiation of the third instant larva, and we block it specifically in this window of time, the expression of the protein, to see what were the initial events that were happening, happening during the degeneration. We wanted to get at the very beginning what was going on to see which ones were the gene more sensible to the levels of the protein. Okay? What we found, we did the same stain, what we found is the acute silence during this time these tissues, when these neuromuscular junctions are already formed, they are already formed, we block it there, we saw that they, compared with the wild types, we didn't see much differences in number of branches, in number of, number of synaptic buttons. This is something that we will see in the practical, how to count num, uh, branches, how to count uh, synaptic buttons, how to look at the same structure all the time in different backgrounds. Um, we saw that the Acute silence it doesn't change the innervation of this muscle or the shape of the motor neurons terminal. Okay? There is no retraction. Then we say, well, there is not something else, but this flies doesn't work very well. There is functional problems, but not morphological problems, let's say, at this level of at this level of resolution. From some function. Then we wanted to see what were the main functional proteins. The main functional proteins are Synaptic problems related with synapses because the structure was okay, but the function was not so good. Synaptic proteins, which one, the, 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 the majority, I mean, the, the more characteristic synaptic proteins you have, the ones that are associated with the vesicle, the ones that are associated with the plasma membrane that receive the vesicles, and the ones that are structural of the membrane. And when we look at them, one of these guys was, uh, this is the mark, general market for axons. He says syntaxin, this is plan, syntaxin. We look at syntaxin. Syntaxin is a membrane, a plasma membrane protein related with the docking and fusion of the synaptic vesicle. We found that 24 hours of suppression of TPH, syntaxin was strongly reduced compared with synapsin, that is a bit less, or CSP, that is a bit even, even less, and in, at a less extent, or Bruce Pilot. This is Bruce Pilot, is a structural protein that labeled calcium channel that doesn't change at all. You see the same levels, this guy a bit less, but this is very, we found this, this modification very dramatic. In 24 hours, syntax goes immediately down. And then we get into something. Is this, could be this responsible or something or not? Well, we found that this dramatic reduction uh, affects the postsynaptic structure. This is DLG, that is a postsynaptic marker. Okay? Postsynaptic marker cover the presynaptic structure. They overlap and go even further. Complete co-localization of the postsynaptic. Even more, I can tell you. It works this way. When the synapses, the presynaptics arrive to the muscles, send a signal 
to form the, pro the postsynaptic one that is DLG. DLG, when it feels the signal, goes and covers completely this structure, indicating that this indicating that there is kind of signal here. What we found is that the, in the acute silence of TBPH, we have problems already of the nervation. You see, these structures are not complete. They don't look at these ones at all. If we want to see where the synapses uh, take place, that is the glutamate receptors, that they are at the postsynaptic part, we are looking at the postsynaptic here, this is a structural plot, and these are the glutamate receptors, the ones that receive the signal, we found that the acute silence is enough to also disperse this structure. Okay? This is very, these are very early events. Are very early events, and they are not autonomous events, because we are interfering with these cells, the presynapses. And then the postsynaptic is reacting to what they are seeing in the pre. Okay? We are not manipulating these guys. We are manipulating this. Okay. We saw this difference. We saw that syntaxin goes down. We saw that synapsin a bit less, this guy a bit less. On, uh, the ones that were modified mainly was these two ones, these three ones. And then we, we did this pull-down experiment with TDP, for the, with TBPH, and TBPH a, unable to bind to the RNA. No? This is very good control because it's exactly the same protein, but one binds, the other not. We did PCR, retrotranscriptome PCR, uh, quantitative PCRs, and then we found strong enrichment of syntaxin in TBPH. This is the messenger of syntax, indicating that TBPH physically interact with the messenger of uh, syntax. In the mutant, the syntax, this physical interaction, syntax in mRNA levels are reduced in TBPH minus alleles, and the protein levels were confirmed here, are also reduced in TBPH minus alleles, and can be rescued putting the protein back. Okay? Then we started to manipulate it here, and say, well, is syntaxin expression that was done regulated to revert this decrease in the synaptic syntaxin alone, able to revert these phenotypes, you know, it was reduced to see the role. We put the syntaxin back at huge levels, at high, higher levels, and this experiment you can, you can see here. We found that if we put back syntaxin, we managed to recover the postsynaptic structure. This is a DLG. This is expressing GFP, or this is expressing syntaxin in TBPH minus phenotypes, TBPH minus backgrounds. Only putting syntaxin, we were able to recover the postsynaptic structure and also managed to recover the organization of the glutamate receptor, the distribution and organization of the glutamate receptor, together with the motility. You see? Putting synapses is enough to recover this innervation, recover the innervation, and recover the, and recover the motility. Indicating that this has an important role, and this is what we think is what is going on here, that these problems with the syntaxin level due to direct interaction with the messenger, when you don't have syntaxin, then you start having synaptic problems, and the defects in synaptic problems, presynaptic problems, produce non-autonomous defects in organization of the postsynaptic structure, and is the way that denervation in these cells start. We went on on this study because we know that this denervation defect is the initial modification that happened. And now we are analyzing what's happened later. No? Let it, and then to make it uh, brief, we we'll say that initi initiate with synapsis defects and then goes and progress to neurodegeneration that involves DNA damage, and then we are studying the mechanism by why this um, in the way that to see how could we pre uh, prevent. We saw that this synaptic defect and this can be revert, and this is uh, the, 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 the good news, okay? I still have some time to explain to you the role of some other cells that have a role also in this process of the, of the, the, the generation, no? That they are the glia. Why the glia? The glia is because the characterization of the neurodegeneration looks like that. You see, these are TBPH aggregates that you, in the brain, but this could be involving many different cell types. No? This is what the way we start. This could be neurons, could be glia, could be many things. And then we wanted to analyze what was the role of TDP in the glia. It was initial experiments to see if the glia were having a role, a, a, a role in the neurodegeneration. You know? Glia is an important tissue that could uh, have an important role also in the maintenance of the nervous system. 
First thing that we did is to see whether or not TDP was expressing in the glia. And when we found different types of glia, Angela would tell us better than this is true, we found that the central glia, the glia that is present in the, in the, in the, in the brains, you know, this is the ventral cord, the glia that is present in the brains, or the glia, the peripheral glia that is present in the nerves. These are the glia that covers the nerves. And these are the nerves that go to the muscles to innervate them. We found that TDP is present in all these ty types of glia, and then we did the experiment, this experiment that was to silence TDPH expression exclusively in glial tissues and see what happened. What we found is that these are the neuromuscular junction, how the glia looks like. You see, this is the wild type, the glia covers some part of the structure of the neuromuscular junction, these are presynaptic uh, nerves, these are the glia in green. You see, this is the part of the structure that covers, that is bigger if you do this experiment live, okay? The fixation gets a kind of retraction of the glia because they are kind of philopodic moving here and there like Angela showed it in her video. This is happening when you fix it, you do retract it. But if you see live, we see that this glia covers almost 90% of this structure, okay? When we repress the activity of TBPH in the glia, we saw that the, this is the changes, no? The area, the area that uh, affects uh, that uh, covered muscles is get strongly reduced, okay? This goes together with motility problems and with problems in the lifespan. And with blocking the glia, these flies walk less, the, the larvae walk less, and the adults a lot less, and die a lot before, okay? And now gets, the part gets interesting. What is affecting the suppression of TBPH in the glia? We did uh, evoke, we analyzed the evoke uh, potentials in collaboration with a friend of us in Padova, Adam Lilian. What we found is that if we check a synaptic transduction from nerve, from brain to muscles, blocking in the glia, we found that there is reduced synaptic transmission. The, 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 evoke, the potentials are reduced, indicating that the inputs are lower. But we did this experiment with less synaptic transmission but basically recycling in presynaptics are similar, okay? It's an experiment live that we, we made that is using this dye <coughs> that will be captured by the, by the synaptic activity of this presynaptic timing. If you compare the wild types with the mutants, you see that there is no difference in the capturing that indicate the synaptic recycling. Synaptic recycling is the same, but synaptic transmission is reduced. This was the observation. Um, this is the opposite experiment. This was very striking. What we did is to rescue TDP function in TDP mule null flies, expressing the protein only in glia. The expression exclusively in the glia, in the complete mutant, was able to recover the axon wrapping, was able to recover non-autonomous presynaptic growth. <coughs> Compare this with this. Recover non-autonomous synaptic growth and recover motility a lot. Recover lifespan. Okay? Expressing only in the glia was able to recover neuronal function and neuronal growth. And then we try to analyze here uh, what happened at the molecular level, and then what we found basically was that when we um, express TBPH, uh, express TBPH uh, in the glia, TBPH in the glia in TBPH minus flies. Okay, these are TBPH minus flies expressing the protein exclusively in the glia. We found that we were not able to rescue syntaxin. I showed you before that syntaxin was not regulated in mutants. We cannot rescue syntaxin levels when we place this protein in the glia. But we managed to rescue a little bit, or maybe not, DLG. Julia had to help me in this case because she did this one. We didn't rescue the, the distribution of the postsynaptic DLG. Okay, we didn't rescue syntaxin in the pre, we didn't rescue the postsynaptic DLG 
in the post, okay? But we managed to rescue the organization of the glutamate receptor. Glutamate receptor go back. No syntax in the pre, no DSG in the post, but yes, glutamate receptors get back in the postsynaptic membrane. Okay? Strong rescue. We went back to this experiment that we like it a lot, and then to see was this an early modification of TBPH function in the glia, and then we do the uh, acute blocking of the activity of these guys here, and then we found that blocking acutely the function of TBPH in the glia, we didn't affect the axonal wrapping, but we did affect the distribution of glutamate receptor. Okay? And we didn't affect here what is this? syntaxing. Okay? Acute silencing affect glutamate receptor distribution. Rescue, rescue glutamate receptor, but not the others. It's like a TBPH in the glia is talking directly with the glutamate receptor distribution of the postsynaptic membrane. The acute silencing of TBPH in the glia, of course, also affects motility, indicating that this is a, a good news. I mean, if you have problems in, TBP in, the mu in the neurons, you have ELS. If you have problems in the glia, you also have ELS, probably, because it also affects the blocking in the glia, also affects locomotive behaviors. And at this time, we uh, made another experiment that this um, late expression the one that would see we could recover late in the glia, you know, regenerate the system, putting late the expression of this protein in the glia, then we found that putting late, we recover motility, and also we recover the distribution of the uh, glutamate receptor. I think this is this experiment here. Okay? At the end, at the end, we found that uh, in our screening, in our genomic-wide uh, uh, screening, came out that the protein that was that regulated was this EAT, that is a transporter of glutamate in the glia, present in the glia. We found that these guys can bind to TDP, TDP can regulate directly the levels of this messenger. And then we found, what we found is that when we put back this guy or a drug that mimics its function, that is capturing, capturing glutamate, this drug capturing glutamate through the same channel, that was done regulated, we managed to recover the these structures, motility, and with the drug as well. Okay? And this thing, this is the, 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 the scenario that is going on, is that defects of TBPH in, like, in the glia is required for the axonal wrapping, but when we have problems, we have these retractions, we have problems in the handling of extracellular glutamate due to problems with the Transport that we cannot recapture this glutamate, and then the excessive, gluta excessive of, excess of glutamate may affect the distribution of the glutamate receptor, down regulating them. This is the hypothesis. Without having much problems at the beginning, because of initial events, having much pro problems in the presynaptic uh, terminals. Then, I will finish here, I think I will finish here, and the last part, I will anticipate the last part that I will give it in my next talk. Is what we found is that acute defects, defects, early defects of TDP43, either in neurons or in glia, what they have in common, what they have in common is that they affect the organization of the glutamate receptor. This is the, the main thing that they have in common, indicating that might be some molecules present in both responsible for this thing. To answer this, we went into genomic-wide analysis that we will, I would like to, to, to show you these, these experiments in, in my next talk because it's already one hour and I'm, I want you to ask questions if you want. And thanks. The people in my lab, this was, this was the the work, mainly the work of Julia Romano that is here in my hand, to, um, in his postdoc analysis, and all the people that collaborated in the project that you saw here. Okay, thank you very much. And then